My name is Paul Houghton, and uh, I came here from Helsinki, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about performance. Now, if you're, how many of you are mobile developers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, server. A few more. Okay. Good. Um, have any of you done uh, mobile Java, J2ME, or have you been working with Android? Yeah, yeah. The other one. They warned me not to walk, talk too much about it, but I've got some demos for you anyway. Um, but uh, what this is really just about my favorite topic in the whole world, because I like to make things go fast. And uh, I really want to talk to you about some of the things I've been doing and the ways I do it. All of this source code is available, so you get links to it. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into the source code, but just try to get you the flavor of how, how to think about approaching it and how it's different from the server-side stuff you might have been looking at in the past. So let's dive in. Uh, there's not much of an agenda. I'm basically going to punch down every myth that I know that's out there about mobile performance one by one, because I assume that you're developers if you came to an advanced session like this. And let's just talk about the furry edge where there's some misconceptions and misunderstandings about it. So I've literally taught in places like this in northern Finland. And also I'm privileged to travel around the world. This is uh, Lagos, Nigeria, where I'll be going in a couple of weeks again. Um, there are some very skilled developers around the world. And mobile Java for them may not be the same as the purely Android view that you have here. So I want to give you a little bit of perspective on that and why this matters. So even if someone is using a phone such as this one, this is the Asha 311, costs about $120. And it has very similar performance to an Android device. So it's competing with the low-end Android devices from China, and it's already pretty much crushed BlackBerry in many cases. Very nice phones, but there's one main thing. There's not a lot of RAM. So you need to design differently. You need to think differently to build your apps to go crazy fast in a phone that has a great processor, one gigahertz processor, and not a lot of memory. But nobody wants slow phones. So the reason we're concerned about performance isn't just because we love to make things go fast. But nobody will wait. The whole user experience with mobile is a bit different from web apps. You pull it out of your pocket, you hit a button, you expect it to come up right away, you do one thing, and you get out. So you might be done in 15 seconds. You're not waiting around for page loads and wind and wind and let's go out and get the CSS from here and fiddle with that. So it's a very different use case, and there are different patterns that uh, we want to talk about for how that's done. So the model that's between my ears is if I'm not totally maxing out every chip on the phone, I'm not doing my job right. So when I see something lazy like this, or I install an app and it's running, I expect it to be maxing out all the cores. Not just all the cores, but all the memory, all the network bandwidth, because the faster I can get things done, the faster the phone can shuttle back into low power mode. So the faster you go, the less battery you use. You have the same amount of work to get done. If you can get it done quickly, it's good for everybody. Um, the phones are typically like this. You may not be familiar with them, but we're dealing with five-point capacitive multi-touch, accelerometers, all the goodies you're used to, just in a budget package. I have to laugh when I look at like the keynote. Did you guys go to the keynote on Sunday? And they're talking about how they're going to get everything down to 10 megabytes. You know how much RAM is in this phone? Two megabytes. Everything I show you today runs really nicely here. And fast. As fast as an Android phone with 128 megs. And it's about architecture. So when Microsoft is bragging that they have an app that's doing nothing, and it only uses 10 megabytes of memory. I'm like, 
Okay, it's a whole different world. Um, but let's look at one of the apps. This is just a video I shot. Bang, you're up, you've got your data. We've got some special effects squeezing out the pictures as they come in. And we can go through and now we're on the net. So this, the key to the way that worked is everything is in the cache. So really cache-centric, cache-heavy. Because just like in this room where you have lousy network that has maybe a few kilobytes of data, that's the real world that people are dealing with out there. And you have to design your app for the worst case, not for the best case scenario when they have 4G on a sunny day and they're not moving and they have lots of battery power. So let's go through and bust some myths. Just go through them one by one. And please stop me if you want to. I have a lot of material. I could talk for days on this, but we've got one hour. So if you want to go into more depth on something, stop. And then we'll focus on the things that are most interesting. Um, Android is the biggest market opportunity for mobile Java. True or false? Well, yes and no. 675 million phones in active use like this one. That's the size of Android and iPhone put together on a worldwide basis. But it doesn't show up anywhere in the, in the specs. They try hard to classify this as not a smartphone so that they don't look small compared to that. It is a very different environment. It's used in different places. Especially look at this. 13% of people in the richest countries have phones like this. So for me in Finland, it's a drinking phone. It's so I can find myself face down in the snow and I have something that's definitely going to work and it's still going to have battery power. And when I'm talking to people in places like Indonesia, half of the people there have Nokia phones. And it's not that they don't have choices and it's not that they don't know any better. It's that this is a really good device for their needs. And now it runs apps really well also. So a large reason that I go out training is so that we get local developers in each country to make the content that the local people want to consume. And there are a lot of downloads, a lot of numbers there. Cross-platform is a really interesting thing that comes up frequently. How do you make one app that's going to run everywhere? Okay, maybe you believe me. You say, all right, Paul, how do I actually make an app that's going to run on both? I'll show you and I'll give you some source code. Um, there are several approaches. I'll show you how I go about it. And whether or not you do it that way, you'll hopefully learn something and uh, be the better for it. Um, the first approach people use is a library for the UI. So they say, all right, let's do a soft UI like Swing, put it on top of Java. But it never feels quite right. My company has 150 people in Northern Europe. Most of them are developers. The customers never want this because the customers are companies like Vodafone or Nokia or Rim Blackberry, or their big brand customers very often, who want it to be sharp, and they want it to be really nice, and they want it to feel native on the phone. So we've actually adapted Luit so that it looks and feels like native. So that's a very nice choice when you're dealing with the higher end phones. But there are phones, I don't have any here, that go down to th about $35 that will run these apps. But you don't want to necessarily use Luit there. So there are other choices. Um, but you have to think, why do I want to abstract my UI? I think, and I'm maybe the only person in the world, but I think you should abstract your back end and do the boring stuff once and make the UI good. So if I have to communicate with some company's server to get music, to provide voting information, all of the well, Facebook, hey, that never came up before. Well, I don't want to do that over and over again, so I wrote a library. 
that does that. And it also works on Android. So you can choose to do the back end once, and then you can choose whatever UI you want. It's not a UI library, it's just tools. And that's what I talk about engine abstraction. You don't have to use my library, but hopefully you can think about that approach because Java does run everywhere. Even on weird cousin phones like C Sharp, that's basically Java, right? C Sharp branched off from Java and they didn't pay any licenses either. <laughs> so we've got at least two successful spin offs. And that's good flattery. Java is alive and well and kicking. Um, concurrency is, is one of my pet things. The way I can get things to go fast is by making the phone do many things at the same time. All of these phones are single core. So concurrency doesn't mean I have to have a uh, four core Tegra device. Actually, some of the two core devices outperform the four core devices. It depends. There are many factors of how a phone performs and people think, okay, should I be using java.concurrent data structures that are going to allow my hash table to have 16 simultaneous accesses if they happen to spread out. Sure, but this is built for server guys. So most of the stuff you find about concurrency doesn't really apply to how are you going to do it in the phone world. This is a nice book. I look forward to reading it. But when I'm doing stuff on the phone, half of it is wrong because they're not thinking about working in a really small environment and the fact that I don't actually care that much about synchronization and thread collisions when I only have four or five threads anyway. It's just a whole different set of problems and a whole different set of solutions. And the best way is to look at some examples and, and think about that. Um, you can have functional concurrency, which is a nice data structure that automatically gives you some parallelism. Microsoft offers that same sort of thing in, in Windows 8. They try to make it auto magic for you. You can have an algorithm which is inherently parallel. One of my favorite tricks is to request everything from the web simultaneously. So I'll just queue up 30, 40 HTTP requests and I have four workers and I'll pull the data as fast as I can and start shoveling more and put that back on the net and let it work itself out. So there's no static organizational structure. There's just a single queue of stuff that needs to be done. And I'm not queuing up events, I'm queuing up code. So this is like uh, lambdas. I put a little snippet of code on the queue and that's what's going to execute. Almost all of my code is something, usually an anonymous inner class, that I throw onto the queue and say, do this, do that. And then I include a strict separation between things that are done on a worker and things that are done on the UI thread. That's one of the most complex and most difficult and least documented parts of this process. Because they're parts of every UI which magically have to be done on this thread or that thread and they don't tell you until it breaks, usually when you're giving a live demo. So if you pay attention to what should be where, and everything that doesn't have to be on the UI should be on the background. And just, I'm trying to make it easy for you to shove the data back and forth between those two. For example, in Android, they have something called async task. Have any of you guys used that? It's nice. If you use that, you understand what this is about. I have a full implementation of async task. You can use it exactly like you're used to, or there's some simplified and slightly different patterns based on that. So async task is the top of the hierarchy, then there's a task, then there's just a workable which does something in the background and doesn't even come back. But everything has side effects, so usually it's getting something from the net, setting a variable, storing something. <clears throat> so this is the sort of stuff that goes on in my head when I'm designing an app to make it go crazy fast. I usually have four workers, you can have a few more if you have several cores to deal with. But this is what I do on a 
single core one gigahertz phone or less. There is no big benefit with going with more. There's a slight cost, but you would have a hard time measuring it. There is a slight cost of going with less. So that seems to be the magic number. And I've got the one UI thread. All the UIs I've seen lately all have one thread. Now they said in the keynote that they had played around and if you have a separate thread for the rendering, you can double the speed because of concurrency. I fully agree. It's great, go for it if it makes sense. You can do that as a separate dedicated thread or you can do that as pieces of code on the worker. But the key as you do this is each of those pieces of code executing on a worker doesn't last that long. Because what you don't want is for the queue to grow too much. And the other key that I'm always thinking about is when I put something in, I can put it in as high, medium, or low priority onto the queue. If it's high priority, I just put it on the bottom of the queue and it's the next thing that's going to be done. For example, if it's a UI element, I have an image that I need to display, I need to go out and get it, or I need to load it out of flash memory, I'm going to make that a high priority item. If the user does something else before that result comes back, something else may bump it up. Um, by default, I put things in as normal priority. And I use low priority pretty much only for prefetching. So I'll fire it up, load up things on my first paint, and then I'll start prefetching. And I never use more than one thread for that. It's automatic if you just put things in library. And I'll just get the data as it comes. But with a single core, keep in mind that your CPU can do something, and if it runs out of work, it will switch. If it's getting, doing a heavy memory access, it might even switch. All of those are optimized and taken care of for you, so you don't need to worry about it. Just hit it as hard as you can, as many ways as you can, and let it sort it out. Um, the problem I've had teaching this is it looks complicated, right? I started doing this because I had some students in South Africa who said, all right, you're running your mouth. How are you actually going to do that? What does it look like? Show us a good example. And then I stayed up till 4 a.m. and that was Tantalum 1. And I've been evolving it for a year and a half, two years since then. So Tantalum 4 is in the repository. You can see that but I'm not fully happy to punch it out as a zip file yet. But you're welcome to join me if you like this. It is fully open source Apache 2. And I was figuring, how can I make this easier? Because it is a little bit complicated. You've got all these little bits of code flying around. How do you keep it straight? So I looked, how, how do, does everybody else do it? And it turns out async task is nice. That's one of the most popular. So I copied it. Java 7 has a fork join framework. That's for all this boring server stuff. And it's actually not even for that. It's for academic research. But it's got some nice ideas. There are other fork join frameworks that might be more productive for server work. Uh, so I put fork and join in there. I used to queue things. Now I fork them. It's the same thing. Joining was a little more challenging because I have to have state and then figure out where something is in the execution cycle, but that's also working nicely. So with a join, you essentially say, I would like that result, but I'm not willing to wait more than, say, 200 milliseconds for it. And you can set that time out. If the result comes within that time or if it's already available, you get it right away. Uh, otherwise, you can continue. Yes? Um, it's just synchronization and, and a lock in states. So Java Util Concurrent is probably faster. If and when that ever hits the phones, it'll be great. And I look forward to using it in Lambda expressions with, uh, I think it's coming in Java 8. But it's not there now, so I've got a few years ahead. <laughs> it's a nice time to start designing and playing around and working with that and then we'll adapt when those tools come. But um, it doesn't have VM support for this. 
So everything that I've done, I write in Java 2, and then I pull it over to Java 5, and then I'm going to add Java 7. Yeah, so I start with the small guys because it's easy to take it over, and it works really well. Uh, C Sharp has slightly different things. They're trying to make it sort of automatic in the VM how to do things in parallel for you. I'm a bit skeptic, but I'll keep my eyes open and test it out when it stabilizes. Um, and then we tried to combine some of those best things into one place. So there is a project. It's not all my code, but I'm the biggest contributor. And you're welcome if you're interested in this type of thing. Because it's a nice way to reach a lot of people. If you haven't done mobile, ProGuard is your best friend. And this is a tool you need to understand. Because when I put out a library, I have things in there like JSON that you might not be using. It doesn't matter. ProGuard will strip it out if you don't use it. So it makes your jar file smaller, makes the whole thing run faster. It makes a significant difference, and it can also help you on server side, although it's less popular there. It can make your debugging a little bit more complex if you're looking at long stack traces. Um, Recursive algorithms is one other thing that is nice for mathematicians and computer science classes. Don't go there on mobile, because you have limited amount of stack memory, and there is always a non-recursive solution. And usually, it works out better for you. So just in general, be cautious about which algorithms you choose. Be very aware of large things that you allocate, and how soon do you deallocate them. Um, I've got links in the slides, and I can provide you references. What we've gone through, and we've done a lot of testing on the phones to see which patterns work and which ones don't work. We'll have a few of those at the end, but it's an interesting read if you like high performance stuff, because some of the results are surprising. Um, all UIs are single threaded, so is multi threading difficult? Well, uh, it is necessary if you want to use the techniques that make the phone go really fast. You can see and smell the difference. It's worth doing. Here's a little bit of code um, for reading something from flash memory. So I create a new, I don't know if I have a pointer here, but at the top we create a new workable. Workable is just an interface that has one method execute. And it executes on a worker thread, always, just for simplicity. And it goes out and it does the synchronous reading data from flash memory. And then based on the result it gets, it's either going to call one of two methods on a callback, most of which is off screen here. So workable doesn't have any callback structure inherent in it. But one level above that, a task is an object implementing workable that takes care of those for you if that's what you want. Slightly less efficient. Usually you won't smell or care the difference. It's useful if you're returning a result. Um, not crazy hard code. It will get even more pretty when we have lambda expressions in the language. And down at the bottom, we fork it, which means we push it on the queue as item 0 so that it's going to be the next one to be done, since it's high priority. Um, here's an example of a demo application called Picasa Viewer. And I obsess on start time. I obsess on what happens when I hit the icon, how soon is it going to come up, what am I going to see on that first screen, is it dynamic? Let's see. So there's the app. Click the icon, we're in. Pretty nice. And we'll have the same app on this phone. You can play with it. It runs on some of the low-end phones, uh, which don't have a full screen touch. They, have, they call it touch and type. You have a QWERTY keyboard and touch on the same device. If you ask a lot of questions, you can take one home. Um, and we have lots of other goodies. The 
This is an example that has QWERTY keyboard. So it's, it's pretty nice. What is going on there is I'm actually doing a live local search out of the cache. So if I've done a search previously and I type in CAT or CAR, as I'm typing, the result comes up right away with all the pictures. So you can run the whole app offline. And you can test that. These phones, these apps are inherently online, offline. And that's extremely important if you have spotty network infrastructure or if data costs too much to be practical. So we're really trying to take care of the budget when you're putting apps in people's hands. I don't want them to give more money to the operator than they have to. I used to work in an operator. They are evil. <laughs> I was a business analyst, of all things. <laughs> yeah, I got rid of that. Multi-threading, it can slow you down. Um, but most of those cases are theoretical. So if you are using synchronization the classic way, just don't stay in a synchronized block that long, and you'll be fine, because you don't have that many threads. Think about it common sense, but don't be scared of it. It's not a big deal. And all the performance patterns I'm talking about, they absolutely require it. You can get your app to be four, five times faster than the serial version doing this, because the phone really has multiple chips. It really can read from flash memory at the same time that it's doing networking, at the same time it's processing, at the same time it's doing memory operations, and Bluetooth. So you can jam it. You can have several HTTP connections live. And it's worth doing, because there's a, there's a start and an end time. And if you stack all those up, you just it's like a pile of cards coming in in Tetris. They just fall where they may. Um, but we're not at all interested in scaling. This is the opposite of these scaling talks you have on the server side, right? I'm just here to burn as much power as quickly as I can and get it done. It's all burst mode. So anything you can do to trick the eye to give the perception of responsiveness. One of my favorite tricks is I hit the button and I start sliding the screen in. I don't even have anything to put on the screen, but it's sliding. So by the time it slides in, I'll have something to put on the screen. Meanwhile, it looks crazy fast. So you can trick the eye. It's like being an illusionist to design a nice UI. And synchronization. Everybody thinks, oh, synchronization is slow. Well, look at the hardware specs for an ARM processor. It's got at least a six-stage pipeline in there. It does the synchronization in one stage while it's doing something else while it's chewing a sandwich. So it really is basically free. Forget about it. Don't use it if you don't have to, but don't worry. It doesn't cost anything. Weak reference. Have any of you guys used this class? It's in standard Java. Very good. Yeah, it's twisted. So let's say each of you guys is an image inside my phone, right? And I'm just going to like throw you all into the phone, and if the phone needs some space, it's going to flush a few of you out of memory. And I won't know till I request. So weak reference is just an object that has one pointer. And that one pointer is a soft pointer. It's weak. So I'm telling the computer that if there aren't any normal pointers to that object, then you can trash this thing if you want to. So, yeah, so I don't throw anything away. I just put it all in a weak reference hash cache. And it's all automatic. In, there's examples in there. You can just pull the one method out if that's what you want. But it's brilliant. You just throw everything into a hash table, and it grows as much as you want to. And if you pull back and you get a null, then you get it out of flash memory. And if there's nothing in flash memory, you get it off the net. All automated for you. You can do that any way you like, on any platform you like. You could make servers like this if you want to. But it's a bit of work, so people don't. And they're really losing a huge opportunity. Because I have the exact same app running on a phone with 2 megs and with 128 megs. And it's comparable. This one is faster. 
yeah, it's 1.2 gigahertz dual core, and it has all the memory and stuff. But you won't really notice a difference. You can see it in the videos, and you can try it for yourself. Um, yeah, so if every time you see pictures on the screen, I'm only referencing those with a weak reference. And if I try to paint and I don't have it, I'll, do, I'll fork off a get, and it'll pull it out of flash memory a fraction of a second later and put that on the screen. Yeah. So well, that was a cold boot. There was nothing in memory. Everything came from flash. Bang. In parallel. Because I want to start reading, and then I want to start decoding the image. Remember, the image is a byte array. And I want the image to turn into something else. So I'm reading and then decoding. But meanwhile, I've released the lock so the next thread can start reading and decoding, and the next one can start reading and decoding. That's why I just queue everything up and let it sort it out. It's crazy fast. You can tell when it's coming off the net because it's a lot slower. This is in one of these horrible Java 1 networks, so there's no network performance to speak of, <laughs> um, as you know. Uh, everybody thinks they need more memory. Well. Go with weak reference. It's a very simple class, but it's easier to like look at an example that uses it. Another good example is a uh, lightweight user interface toolkit, or LUIT. They use that for images, and they use it properly. You can use it in other ways. If you have procedural graphics, if I need to paint up an image so that I can scroll it quickly, just use them with weak references. Don't pull them, throw them away. Well, you, you can pull them in some cases, depending on how heavy they are. So there's a, there's a cutover point. If it's a really big image and really expensive to rebuild, then you should pull it to reduce your garbage collection thrash. But in general, just throw it away if it's not there. The one trick with these that took me a while to figure out is I started scrolling, and then stuff was like blinking on and off. It was disappearing because they were garbage collecting. You have no control over what's going to be collected. So I came up with a trick. I just create a normal reference to the things I really want to keep on screen. But I still get everything from the weak reference hash cache. It keeps my code really simple. But if I want to make sure something's going to stick around, let's say I'm scanning through several images, I'll preload the image on the left and the image on the right and keep a normal reference to those. And that takes care of it. Those items are going to be stuck in memory. It reduces that blinking effect if weak reference is the only reference you have. Um, well, you've all got 4G networks, right? Right. Yeah. As long as there's one weak reference to that object, it won't be garbage collected. So if I want to make sure something stays around because it's on screen, maybe I just make a pointer to it, and then I know it's there. But I don't have to change my code flow. It's just sort of, to the compiler, it looks like I'm doing this for no reason. Yeah. Or when the object that owns it dies, it, then it's gone. And then it will stick around. And if I come back very quickly, it's all still there. It doesn't even have to go to flash. Saves power, saves time. Uh, mobile internet, you've all got 4G, 10G phones, whatever, right? You don't need this stuff. I just go and get everything off the net. Try it right now. <laughs> yeah? The net sucks. It's only available to some people sometimes. So for design purposes, if you're building a mobile service, it's almost useless. It's a best case scenario. Yeah, you can get 4G, and it's even faster than the Wi-Fi in your house if you have enough money. But you can only do that every now and then. So uh, when you design the service, you want to design it for plain old low bandwidth stuff, because that's what people are going to have to work in. That's why I'm in love with caching. Caching is the boss for making your apps go well. And servers, like 
you know they all bog down and break and you can't log into Oracle when you're trying to find out where your session is going to be, right? Um, people think, here's another myth. I have to design a different app for every phone. No. If you think about it, you can make the app work with keyboard, non-keyboard. I just have Angry Birds because I happen to have the picture laying around. But it's a good example. They took the Box 2D open source library, did it in C, put it on every phone. When they needed to put it on Windows Phone, they ported it to Windows Phone. I know the guy who did it. He's brilliant. When they ported it to J2ME, I'm not sure who did that. But it plays very much like it does on a high-end Android phone, on a small phone with not much memory. It takes a bit more work, but it's fun. I mean, why do the easy things? Um, Adaptive design. This is a, a web thing, and all the web guys think they're so cool because they have a language that has no structure at all. But you can use the best of their world, which is they already have Lambda expressions and things we would love to have in Java and C Sharp. So you can throw around pieces of code like objects, which is really fun. But they have a new framework every week because they're all trying to figure out what to do with all that power. Um, Adaptive design is one of the best things they have going. So the idea is you make one app, and then rather than hard coding it for 137 different screen sizes and all of that, and doing all that on the server, that's like responsive design. Adaptive design, it's in the, there's some logic inside the phone itself, and it figures it out. It says, OK, the screen is this wide. Let's manufacture a graphic and stamp the logo on the left side. This type of logic is not particularly hard. Um, and if you have an app like on the BBC Reader, if I have it vertically, I've got, I guess, three rows of icons. And if it's horizontally, it's something like five. So as you rotate it, it just changes it around. That's adaptive design, just common sense stuff, how you lace things out on the screen. And one piece of code can do that. It's, can be ugly if statements if you do it wrong. But think about it. It's a nice little design challenge. But try to um, enhance when you have a feature. For example, uh, this phone has a bar at the bottom covered with icons, which this phone doesn't. So I enhance the application by adding that navigation bar and some of the other features to this app. And then on this phone, I just put normal soft keys. That's the fallback. A little bit of if statement, and it, it goes quite easily. Um, there's a picture showing responsive design is going through some mediator like a server, whereas adaptive, you just take care of it yourself based on the device you're in. The nice thing is, you can run well in devices you've never even seen before. They might not have been released, so your code lasts longer if you plan around this. When you're dealing with large screens and tablets, yes, you do need to spend more time on the design, on the graphics. You may need a separate graphics set. You may need also that for localization. You might want gaudy colors in some countries. Um, it's up to up to those, but those are easy additions. Is there any way we can utilize an OSGI approach? OSGI, what is that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Nice. Um, I've done that. I didn't call it OSGI, but yes. You can download it, and there's some advantages. The bigger, there's a, a cousin of this phone, which has relatively slow flash memory. And so when the jar file is really large, if everything is in there, it starts to grind, and it affects the launch time. So I'd rather have a small jar file and pull it in from the server and store it. You can also use in-app purchase, or you can actually bury the stuff in and, and crypto it on the device. So you've got in-app purchase with operator billing and all of that on the Nokia phones. The only thing that you're missing is push. 
but you have push because you have SMS. You can send push directly peer to peer and wake up an app at any time. So let's look at it running on a slightly different device. Notice we've got soft keys instead, still fast response. I'm not too happy with that little flash that appears on the screen, but there's some differences with the virtual keyboard because I want to have the search field active immediately and all the time, and I don't pop up a virtual keyboard when I'm doing that. Here I click search. It's grinding on the network to go and get pictures of cats from Picasa web service. And eventually Picasa comes back with some images. There were a lot of people on the network at that point. Um, but I can hit the delete key and start typing in something else, do another search for pictures of dogs. And again, I'm grinding. I, I had an empty phone, so I'm loading up the cache. And each time those things come in, I'm storing it in the flash memory at the same time I'm putting it on the screen. So it may not be flash cached by the time it shows up in the screen, but the coherence is good. And I can go over to the featured images like that. So cross-platform design, I use a J2ME first approach. So I start with the smallest phone, make it run, and then it's easily going to run on a big phone, right? It's just going to be a little bit faster. It works very nicely. You do have to give up some of your nice toys. That's the gap I'm trying to make up with the library. Some of the toys are even nicer than the ones you might be used to, related to parsing and such, perhaps. But it's not your favorite set, so I understand not everybody will like it. Go with the small phones. If you need to do something like storage, I have a little abstraction layer where I replace one type of flash memory access with another. Very simple stuff. So anything that you want to put into your app like this, um, you can, but then the boring crypto and other things only has to be done and maintained once. And then that same jar file can pull, be pulled into Android, it can be pulled into desktop Java or server Java. I once made an application that had the same exact database on the server and the client. I tuned it a little bit differently, but I couldn't find one out there, so I made my own. It worked very nicely. I never lost data. Completely online, offline stuff. But the difference I have from the mainline view is this sort of nativist. If I'm on an Android device, I want it to look like an Android app. If I'm on a Nokia device, I want it to look Nokia, etc. So um, the code name one guys are not here, I think, but they have a nice approach that they try to make it look native, and they're doing a pretty good job. I haven't investigated enough to, to know in depth. With Luit, if you go to Nokia's website and get their packaging, it's been pimped up and sped up and runs nicely. And it will look and feel pretty close to a native app, but you gain nicer transition effects. Um, but this RAM caching with weak reference is an important part of how you can make it run and take full advantage of the big phones at the same time. So here's the Android device, dual core. This is an Evo 3D, and the network still sucks. And it has to pull in some images from the net down at the bottom of the screen there. But the next time we come in, that's all going to be ready. So I can click over to the search. I didn't implement a live search as you type on this version. But now it's searching for pictures of cars and pulls them in. There are three classes to make this whole app run on Android versus what we have brought over from our J2ME app. Three classes, mostly just for laying out a grid of images Everything else is the same. And suddenly you have three times the potential number of users that you had before. Now they're in different countries. They may not have as much money. They may have different user needs. You have to decide. But I would rather make my apps with nice tools, the ones that I'm familiar with, um, 
for both. It's kind of a why not. And we get some more pictures. And just like on the J2ME, it's storing the data in an SQL database, in this case, on the phone. So <clears throat> another myth. I have a designer. I should just trust everything he tells me because he's cool and he wears thick rim glasses, right? <laughs> um, don't be a moron. The designers have a specific world view. And it doesn't involve motion and speed as much as the way your head works as a developer. So they look at screens. They can make things really pretty. They can come up with kind of cool concepts. And they can come up with a nice flow between the screens. And then you need to push back. So make it a, a hands-held approach. In our company, we have, I don't know, 100 and some des developers and probably 15 designers. And the reason we started hiring and making our own designs is because we were working with companies like Disney, which would bring in some marketing agency that has never done mobile. And they come up with some really stupid idea. And we have to clean it all up. And then you spend all your days in meetings. And it's a mess. And then they, they throw another Mickey Mouse over the table to you. And you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> I'm not singling out Disney. I mean, this happens over and over again. Name any major brand, and they've got a marketing agency that sold them on something that may or may not be a good idea. Sometimes they're brilliant. They're ideas I would have never thought of. I won't name any of the ones that failed, customers that didn't pay. Um, but from the UX world, the three numbers you need to keep in mind is 100 milliseconds makes it feel like it's instantaneous. If you can get it done in that time, people are happy. One second, if it's more than that, it breaks their flow of thought. They're going to notice that it's more than 100 milliseconds, but the time you get to 1,000 milliseconds, you're at the limit. Then they're going to start thinking about something else, like you know, how to scratch the doors on your car. <laughs> 10 seconds, they're gone. They're somewhere else. So that's the time limit that we're dealing in. And you don't have time to go out on a broken network to respond to that always. So get the data beforehand. Prefetch it. Just run it sort of hybrid online, offline, if you can. Not every app works that way. Um, Here's an example where you need to add value to the user experience as a developer. So what's wrong with this startup experience? Flash, flash, flash. All right? Here's another example. Because a viewer with a little extra flash in there. Show it again. Maybe. See if I can break the computer. Okay, some extra flashing. It's not a very clean experience. Here's your first experience with the Picasso viewer. It goes through like three different states before it settles down quickly, but not so pleasant. So there's the code. We load a feed. In this case, it's JSON data. In the BBC, it's XML data. And we're saying get it from anywhere, either from local or from the network. We don't care. We're not going to force a network yet. And then we're going to change the view. And the data is not all there yet, so it starts saying a little winding circle. And then the data comes in a, a second later from the cache. So how can we get rid of that? We can add just the word join. And the result looks like this. That's the wrong video. <laughs> it looks better than that. Um, but by having the word join there at the end, I'm saying do this and stop this thread for up to 200 milliseconds for the result, but not more than that. So if I'm going out to the network, I'm not really going to notice. I'm close to that 100 millisecond barrier. If I'm getting it locally, I'm never going to see a blank screen. 
It's just going to pop right up as a very smooth experience. I might have had those videos in the wrong order. I don't know. Um, some things about performance. Um, there are a lot of things that we call micro optimizations, or I call them mega optimizations because I'm obsessed with these tiny little details. I should have been an accountant. Um, definitely not. The word final should be used everywhere. First thing I do when I'm going to like sport tune somebody's code is I just add the word final to every class and every method that I can. If it writes up red, I delete it. it. Takes you a couple of hours. Your app is twice as fast. <laughs> it's worth doing. Doesn't hurt anything. It actually makes your code a bit better because you're marked this variable is not going to change. I do it on the parameters I pass into a method. It helps me understand what's going on as I'm reading the code. So it's very nice. Sometimes that's the default, but you should never assume that, right? Um, there are some things that are different in the optimization on servers and clients. And a good JVM may be able to automatically munge some of this in with a JIT. And there are more aggressive JITs and other things on server environments. So I don't know exactly how much difference it makes there. But on all the mobile platforms, it makes a big difference. It is the number one thing. Um, static. You would think a static variable is faster than an instance variable, but it's backwards. For some reason, the frame of reference in memory or something, I haven't figured out. But we did the tests, and it's actually 20% slower to use a static than an instance variable. We used the, the slowest phone we could find of recent ones. Addition and multiplication. Uh, you'd think multiplying is slower, right? It's more complicated. But it turns out that they put a lot more uh, silicon in there for multiplying than they did for addition, and definitely not for division. Now, this varies by processor and device. So some of these differences are, this is from a Nokia device. It might be a bit different if you're dealing with a Intel or uh, an ARM device with Android. Different virtual machines and such. But let's look at the performance. Um, use the micro-optimizations as a habit. It's where I differ again with like sort of the standard, like you shouldn't optimize early. Like I can use the word final. It's good, good design. Little things like that matter. It turns out that the bytecode obfuscator or the JIT or both is going to take care of all the bit fiddly manipulations for you, or most of them. So you don't need to work with bit shifts instead of multiply and divide, unless you like that sort of thing. I can show you some really ugly code afterwards if you're curious. Um, but Lambda expressions are basically a piece of code that you pass as an argument, and then it gets executed somewhere else. That's what JavaScript does all the time. That's what's coming to uh, Java. And that's what we're doing when we extend workable to make an anonymous inner class. It's the same thing, just more typing. And fortunately, your IDE does most of the typing for you, so it's not that bad. It's a really nice style to learn, because that's essential to passing bits of code around from one thread to another. You can do it other ways, but it's a lot more typing. Um, focus on the visuals. Focus on the acknowledgment time, that burst speed, the perception of performance. You can trick the eye. You can start painting things before you have all the data. You'll have the rest of it soon. But entertain people. Make it fun. Because everybody in the world, not just in America, has choices as what they're going to do, which app they're going to use. So yours should be fun. It's a privilege for someone to build, <coughs> to be using your application. So fight for them. And the more speed you have in your app, the more spare bandwidth you have to do fun things, little extras.
I once built a museum demo where you walked into a room and you hit a button and it would all shake like a earthquake. I had one channel left, so I made the lights flash. That's, nobody cared about the earthquake. They just liked the flashing lights. People are like cats. Um, and do the back end only once, because it's boring. Focus on the fun things. Back end meaning back end of your application inside the phone, the thing that communicates with the server. And if you can make that piece of code the same on the server and the client, all the better. Then you have time for race tuning and candy. So thank you. And a little plug for our company. We were voted the best place to work in all of Europe. and use a log line. And my logging tools show you the current time. So I'm always measuring the time. And I can see how many milliseconds since the app started. <coughs> I find it the most practical way. So everything is a benchmark. Every time I get an error message, I can kind of see and smell the difference as I tune things up. And let's start handing out some goodies. Good question. Next. Yeah. Um, I had some. Let me back it up a little bit here. If I can see. Um, this is, uh, if you go to developer.nokia.com and just search for adaptive design, you'll find this. This is something on how to make one application that runs on a variety of different form phone, phone factors. Um, and those techniques, in this case, it's written with a Nokia bias, but it, a lot of those techniques are useful for other platforms. <coughs> The project that has all of this code is projects.developer.nokia.com slash tantalum with a capital T. Tantalum is a lightweight metal they use in electronics. Yeah, I think the, the slides they've collected and, and hopefully they'll have it. it. It was not easy to find last year, so you might, yeah. And there was another UR. I think it, that's actually close to the end here. There's another URL. Um, they asked me to write a brief thing about performance, and I came back with half a book. And that's on the website you can read. It's broken up into a few pages, but. Uh, this slide set is 1.2 gigabytes, so it tends to hurt the computer. Um, I've got some cards. I can I can mail you the links if you'd like. That might be the fastest way. Yeah. Put your email address up. 
Yeah, I'll put my email address up. Drop me a, a line. And I can send you a PDF of these also without the video. Or tool, post it somewhere. Is there tooling for separating the amount of time that's spent on the UI thread and the server calls and so on? So that you can compare content? I have to be careful because Reha's here. And I do, the best profiler is actually Oracle's. The one from Nokia, like, it doesn't give very good profiling data. And Reha came in from India, and that's her team who does that, so I don't, I don't want to say, <laughs> say everything. <laughs> but the, um, the data on your total amount of memory and such is available. And what I do is I create a separate, um, I'm using NetBeans, so I'll create a separate build, fire it up in Oracle's emulator, and then I get a full breakdown of which objects are using what. The only thing I'm missing are the proprietary Nokia bits, but it is worth it if you want to get deep into the profiling. And sometimes dealing with a small amount of memory, you definitely do that because it's um, it's sometimes necessary. I had one case making a Facebook client for Series 40, and we had to go through and combine uh, five objects into one object just to save memory because somebody in our company had like 600 friends, and they kept breaking it. It was a good test case. Do you want large? Um, I actually build it first for J2ME, and then I just replace, uh, in this case, there's only one class. I call it Platform Utils, and it has the same signature. And then when I'm building it for Android, um, that one class gets overridden and replaced with the Android version. There were only about eight or ten methods you needed. It had to do with networking, get and post and reading and writing flash. There really wasn't much else needed. Everything else runs out of the box by design. Would you like a shirt? 